PCN is brought to you in part by the following underwriters. Welcome to another episode of PAC TV Community News. We hope you survived this very snowy week. We have a fun show tonight with stories from the South Shore. We'll take you to a Valentine Gala in Plymouth and a mystery room in Kingston. PCN learns about the emergency shelter in Pembroke, and we visit a place where arts are accessible for all. Health and Wellness takes us to healthy appetites to understand probiotics a little bit better, and we have a summertime blast from the past. We begin in Duxbury Harbor to highlight the ending of the dredging project. Duxbury's multi-million dollar dredging project has come to an end. PCN headed over to the harbor to see the last scoops of ocean floor get loaded onto the barges and taken away before all of the earth moving equipment is broken down and permanently removed. Brian Sullivan brings us the story. Here's a site that for the past few months people have gotten pretty used to seeing. And honestly, most folks seem to really enjoy it. There's just something mesmerizing about a giant scoop pulling up 16 cubic yards of ocean floor and then dumping it into a barge. But now, it's all over. This is the uh, end of a $5,500,000 project. $4,800,000 was the uh, Army Corps of Engineer project, and the other $600,000 uh, was spent on the small, what we, we refer to as the local piggyback projects, of which the one that's going on behind you is the last of the five, and that's the town pier and uh, float facility in their, uh, in its dredging. The dredging started in October, and the permits for the project ran until January 31st. Overall, there were roughly 225,000 cubic yards removed from a 21-acre anchorage and a 100-foot wide, half-mile long entrance channel dredged at eight feet for each project. For those keeping score at home, that's a lot of underwater earth and soil being moved around. So what was the purpose? The end goal is to improve navigation. It's to uh, remove shoaling that, that uh, creates obstruction to navigation. And the most vital part of this whole program and actually why we're standing here today is that the town of Duxbury somehow, some way, convinced the Army Corps of Engineers and the federal government that public safety was being jeopardized. We were not able to respond our police boats at, uh, at the time of low tide, which created a, uh, uh, a terrible situation as far as protecting our region and our residents. Once all of the equipment is gone and things return to normal, what can we expect to see? This will be a brand new facility uh, as soon as we put it to get back together in uh, March. So the, uh, the benefit will be immense. There'll be uh, lots of water, there'll be safe water, there'll be moorings. We have hundreds and hundreds of moorings out here that will now have water under them and uh, this is nothing more than a continuation of the infrastructure or your roadways to the water. It uh, creates public safety and it creates navigation. And on the public safety aspect of the project, there is a 32 mile shoreline to deal with, as well as 18 square miles of waterway, which now will be easier to navigate, protect and secure, thanks to this project. That's what makes this project so vital, enabling us to respond. Just behind me, if you look closely enough, you can see survey boats. And what they're doing is they're taking a look at the bottom of the ocean and they're relaying back to here what spots need to be dredged. But for the most part, this job is done. Reporting from Duxbury, Brian Sullivan, PAC TV Community News. Over the weekend, the Plymouth Education Foundation held their sixth annual Valentine Gala at the Pine Hills. Brian Sullivan stopped in on a cold Saturday night to get the story. 
Here at the Pavilion at the Pine Hills Golf Club, the Plymouth Education Foundation holds its annual Valentine Gala event. For six years now, they've been hosting the event the week before Valentine's Day, and each year, the crowd seems to get bigger. Right now, folks are inside enjoying the cocktail hour, doing some bidding for the silent auction, but pretty soon they'll head down the hall to the main banquet room for the award ceremony, where this year's recipient is Mary Henry. While the evening is a great chance to stave off cabin fever and get out to socialize, it also serves as the Education Foundation's top fundraising night. Bob Betters MCs the event and is president of the foundation. The Education Foundation essentially raises funds for programs that we think are innovative, different, etc., that are not funded by tax-based revenues. So, uh, the Education Foundation gave out about $30,000 in grants in 2015, which to provide kind of a supplemental education rather than classroom-based education. Foundation Vice Chairman Anthony Shanna sees this type of organizational fundraising as the long-term answer for public education financing. I think that these educational foundations, especially the one in Plymouth, is really the future for public education. Um, if you think about successful educational systems anywhere at the college level or private high school, they all have two things in common. They have private foundation or they have money and they have an alumni network and the Education Foundation has created both of those. As the cocktail party wound down and folks headed to the banquet hall, the crowd was introduced to this year's Adele Manfredi Award recipient. Mary Henry, who has been a longtime uh, Plymouthian and uh, has been involved in the school system for over 40 years, is receiving the Adele Manfredi Award. And for those who know Adele, she was extremely committed uh, to education in town, so we're very excited about that. Henry received the Excellence in Education Award at her table while everyone in attendance rose from their seats to give a standing ovation. It was quite a moving moment and one that Shenna hopes will encourage more Plymouth residents to be a part of the foundation. Ultimately, we are funding some terrific opportunities in the town of Plymouth uh, for educational purposes, and we hope people want to get involved and get excited about it. From the Pine Hills in Plymouth, I'm Brian Sullivan, PAC TV Community News. Ed foundations are really important. I know I helped start the one in Pembroke, you and did, they're yeah. they're awesome. What they, they do, do so many wonderful programs, and, and the Valentine's Gala is a lot of fun. It's a, yeah. definitely a who's who. Yes, event. yes, definitely. And we want to say congratulations to Mary. Yep, it's very good. Award. Good job, Mary. Yep. Very good. And speaking of Valentine's, I um, got a little something for our news director Kim Yeo. Happy Julie, Valentine's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't that sweet? Just you know, you like chocolates. I actually got you one too. Oh, you did? I did. Hold on a sec. Oh, how nice. Oh, oh, oh. oh great. Here we go. Oh, I don't Just feel to show too, my appreciation for cheap. you, Julie. <laughs> so this is the size she got me, and that's the size I got her. I see great. my value. Great. Okay, I have none. Thank you, Kim. Although this winter has been relatively mild, recent bouts of weather have made it clear that winter is planning on sticking around for at least the next couple of months. For times when the weather knocks out your electricity and possibly hot water, it's nice to know that there are shelters where you can be safe, warm, and fed during weather emergencies. PCN met up with officials from Pembroke to discuss their plan of action for our all-too-common winter emergencies. While the first snowstorm of 2016 left us in better shape here on the South Shore than it did in many of the surrounding states on the East Coast, it did serve as a reminder that winter is officially here and there are likely to be more storms before this season is over. The town of Pembroke dodged a pretty big bullet after this first major storm of the winter because nobody lost power. But in the event that they do, and it's an emergency situation, this is the place that they can come to, the Pembroke Council on Aging. Inside, there are several spacious rooms with plenty of chairs, tables, games, puzzles, televisions, and a fully functioning kitchen, among other accommodations. In fact, three years ago, the COA was put to the test as a shelter while many people in the town lost power for as long as eight days. How many nights were you here? Three nights. Three nights. At least three nights, so, yeah. So Connie was here in Hurricane Nina, was one of the residents in town, oh, yeah. and she stayed here three nights. And we had a great time. We had a great time. What about food? Oh, National Grid came in and Dunkin' Donuts, and we had wonderful food. Anna Siri is the council's director, and after showing us around, explains that the Council on Aging building now serves as the first stop before going to a shelter, rather than being the exclusive shelter that it was in 2013. In the event of an ex a long um, snow emergency or some sort of emergency where our residents would lose their power, we would be the warming shelter. The Council on Aging has three large rooms, plus we have the full kitchen. 
So the folks would come to us and be here. Um, and then we would partner with the library next door, who will be the shelter itself. If there's a chance you'll be spending a night or two in the shelter, it's good to know what to bring with you. Fire Chief Mike Hill. Well, they want to be prepared for about 40, 48 hours. Um, so if you have specific medical problems, you want to make sure you have your medicines for that amount of time. Uh, anything else that you might need, uh, it's going to encompass you being comfortable for that, that amount of time, so maybe change of clothes. As co-director of the emergency management team in Pembroke, he's also on call to help those who may not be able to make it to the shelter on their own. Should we find an um, elderly couple who has a medical problem, it doesn't need to go to the hospital, but should go to the shelter. Well, we'll certainly transport them in the ambulance or take a cruiser or a brush truck, and, you know, if the, the snow is too deep, and, and get them from their home to the shelter. The library shelter has plenty of space, and with the kitchen at the COA, people in need should be in pretty good hands. But, of course, there are limitations. We are really set up for that first 48 to 72 hours just to get people through the, the initial shock of not being able to be in our homes with the appropriate amount of heat or should their home get damaged from the storm. Um, after that, the Red Cross kicks in, all the regional NEMA shelter, uh, FEMA shelters and Massachusetts Emergency Management shelters will take over. And while the 48 to 72 hour time frame is the threshold, according to Chief Hill, it's possible that the shelter can go for longer, thanks to this. Within the past month, the Pembroke Public Library received this brand new generator, so in the event of a storm where people do lose their power, this thing will keep the entire place running. Reporting from Pembroke, Brian Sullivan for PAC-TV Community News. Back in the day, many parents used to make their kids take violin lessons, oftentimes with minimal to no results. Fast forward to modern day and we're seeing a different set of circumstances. In fact, the, the demand among kids to learn to play instruments has grown, but the affordability has become the obstacle. Donna and Tom Hovey are trying to change all that by creating a nonprofit group that will allow anyone, regardless of finances, a chance to take part in the arts. We, we've been teaching lessons um, after school programs for years. Um, whatever school I was teaching at, you know, my wife would, would be teaching lessons there. And we always um, enjoyed teaching the lessons to kids um, giving them that opportunity after school in an after school setting that they didn't get during the school day. Uh, especially the string instruments, a lot of schools don't have string programs. And so we wanted to share that um, opportunity um, in a different format here because we wanted to do it for the community where we live. And we wanted to um, basically give as many kids in our, in our community the chance to have that, that music education. Well, this class gives us the, um, especially as we've been working on my wife's method, um, the validation of what we've been working on our whole careers. We've been teaching music for, for many, many years. And it's a way um, to get our program established so that everybody, as many people as possible, can enjoy it and, and benefit from it. It's, it's in a class format, and we just video the entire class from start to finish. Um, so that the actual way that I teach can become copyrighted. What I've found over the years as, as a music teacher, I, I teach in the public schools. And students who have a music education often excel in all their other academic subjects. It requires discipline, uh, daily practice, things like that, that carry well over into the other subjects. I found this out when I was a student. And one reason why I became a music teacher is so that I could share what I was given in my music education to, to others. And I have taught at the college level, high school level, middle school level, elementary level, all uh, different age groups. And I just find that it, some of the most intelligent kids um, have a background in music. We have had some programs where entire families have taken the class together. Parents and their children learning how to play stringed instruments together. And it's just wonderful, um, a wonderful experience to, for the kids to, to see their parents doing the same thing that they're doing and, and to have a, a family time together. I think a, a big competition we have with music now is, is how popular sports are with kids. Um, a lot of kids are really over-programmed. They're, they're doing so many things. 
and there's not time enough to do everything. I think some parents may have not realized or understood how important music still is. So as we got more of a presence or had more of a presence in the, in the community here, I think we could bring that awareness to, to music and, and to all the arts. I'm hoping that they gain enough skills where they can learn how to make music on their own. They're able to read music, communicate with others, form their own groups with their friends, and, and just love music. Not everyone is going to go become a music teacher or a professional musician, but if they have that love of music, um, it's so important. I have talked to so many adults who say, I quit playing trumpet when I was in seventh grade, and I sure wish I hadn't. What wonderful people Donna and Tom are for doing that. They are. They are. And I think it's exciting because I have a daughter and I'd love to get her into playing an instrument, but one of my obstacles has been the cost. There's, sure. there's some wonderful programs in, uh, on the South Shore, but honestly, some of them are just too pricey and it's, you know, you want to get your kids exposed. I took violin as a kid. I actually kind of liked it, but... Um, oh, yeah. It was good. Secrets that we know now about Kim. Exactly. Kingston Collection has been making many changes with exciting new additions. The mall seems to be looking to be a destination for entertainment on the South Shore. PCN stopped into one of the newest and most unique additions. I'm the manager of the Mystery Room Kingston Collection. The Mystery Room is like an interactive detective experience. So you're in a room for 45 minutes and you have to do puzzles, codes, clues, kind of work together as a team, think outside the box, kind of communicate, and either escape the room or solve the mystery in the room. It depends on the room you choose. We have five different rooms. The owners who own this have five stores across the country. Uh, we have the, this one, uh, we're the only one in New England. We have two in New York, one in Georgia, and one in Texas. Well, I actually really liked it because it was a fun, interactive experience, you know, that I came with my friends and my family, so if you're bored, you can just go with your friends, but it's also to get out of the house. The general age range is kind of 14 and up. We go all the way to 80. Um, we do have some younger kids as well. Uh, if they can read, they can kind of help out and participate in a level one room, but uh, they're not abstract thinkers. We need kind of abstract thinkers, so. It is a really good family fun activity. Um, it's not scary in any way, a lot of people ask that question. Um, it's good for team building, it's corporate team building. Um, it's just a good way to get your brain moving and communicate, it's pretty, pretty cool. Health and Wellness brings us back to Healthy Appetites in Plymouth for some clarifying probiotic information. Hi, I'm Jeff Hills from Healthy Appetites. This is the PCN Health and Wellness segment. I want to talk to you about your gut. Not that part of your anatomy that might be creeping over your waistline. I want to talk to you about your intestines and the beneficial bacteria that live in your intestines. One of the questions we get asked more than any other is, what's the difference between acidophilus and probiotic? Well, up until the year 2000, most of the supplements on the market were just acidophilus supplements, and most of the people who were taking them were taking them to offset the effects of antibiotics. Recently, there's been a huge changes in the probiotic market. Probiotics are the whole range of bacteria that live in your intestines. Acidophilus is just one strain, but because most of the stuff on the market up until recently was just acidophilus, acidophilus has come to be used much the way we use the, the term Coke for cola or Kleenex for facial tissue, it's become the word we use when we really mean probiotic. Probiotics, the bacteria living in your intestines, is 80% of your immune system. And there's trillions of them. There's about 100 trillion of them living inside of you if you're a healthy adult. That's three pounds of bacteria. Three pounds of something you can't see without a microscope. There's a lot of them. The thinking now is that when you take a probiotic, you want to take a large amount and you want to take something that's got a, vari a variation of bacteria. So I would advise you to do something in the, in the range of 
15 to maybe 50 billion if you're doing it for a therapeutic effect. For instance, you're trying to cut, uh, offset the effect of an antibiotic. When you're looking for a probiotic, look for something that has multiple strains, and I'm gonna make this easy for you. Acidophilus is a lactobacillus strain. So when you look on the label, it'll say L dot acidophilus. The lactobacillus strains settle in the small intestine. You also want to look for some bifida strains. They'll say B dot. You may see some other letters in there, but those are the two that, that I think are important. The bifido strains settle in the large intestine. So you want some of both. You don't want to just cover one or the other. Um, L, lactobacillus, little, small intestine. Bifido strain, large intestine, B, big. So that's how you can remember that. We recommend everybody do a probiotic, especially this time of year. Don't just do them after an antibiotic. I'm Jeff Hills from Healthy Appetites. This has been the PCN Health and Wellness segment. We thought it would be fun and very appropriate to flash back to when the weather was warm and our sleeves were short. Enjoy a trip to some summertime fun when our local Eats segment visited Farfars in Duxbury. 35 years ago, a young family loved spending their summers in Duxbury, a beautiful seaside community. Friends and family, beach parties and barbecues, but they realized there was one thing missing, an ice cream shop. So they opened the now legendary Farfar's Danish ice cream. We are here with the woman who makes ice cream dreams come true, Andra Carlton. Andra, I have been a fan of your restaurant for years, but I've always been curious, where does the name Farfars come from? Farfars is the Danish word for grandfather, and my dad is the person who taught us how to make our ice cream, and he was Farfar to the grandchildren because of his Danish heritage. Now, your dad is also, and your family, is also ice cream royalty. Right. Tell me a little bit about your history. Dad um, worked for H.P. Hood in Boston. One of his uh, first jobs with H.P. Hood there was um, working in the base or mix department, and he totally changed the formula for the base that we use. We use it today. I mean, this was back in the 40s that he was working with H.P. Hood, and it's the same recipe. I've been told this by a number of people that are still with H.P. Hood. Now, your ice cream is a Danish ice cream. Tell me what is different about your ice cream than other ice creams we might be able to sample through the summer. Our ice cream is made right here on location and we use a base, the one my dad started us out with, and it has a very high cream base to it. And we kind of compared it to the fact that Danish food is very creamy, very rich, very delicious, and their dessert, desserts especially. I think we need to go sample some of these ice cream flavors. That would be great. Let's go in. Tell me a little bit about your ice cream flavors. Sure. Most of the flavors that we run on a regular basis are the ones everybody's used to and the ones that sell the most, obviously. And then on weekends, we make special flavors. We had orange creamsicle this weekend, big hit. Fourth of July, we do Rocky Beach, and that's got all kinds of things in it. And we do Arrow Chip after the Aerosmith Band. So tell me, what are we having now? This is strawberry cheesecake. It's really creamy. Um, the strawberry sauce is delicious, I think. The cream gets you first, and then you get this amazing, just little tart bite with the strawberry and the sweet. It's incredible. So what are we going to try next? Um, let's do mint chocolate chip. And there's such a nice coolness to this. Again, on a 90 degree day, you've got the cold ice cream and the coolness of the flavors. This is fantastic. You also have some fun, unusual flavors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's try some of those. Well, this one is grape nut. I'm having healthy ice cream. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's yummy. Mm. I honestly would not have expected that because grape nut is just so dry, but this really, it just starts to melt and it just adds a really nice crunch to the ice cream. Mm -hmm. In addition to ice cream, you've taken it all to another level. Tell me about some of your other products that people are just lining up outside for. Sure, uh, root beer floats, big, big, big popular float family. 
Um, then we get into ice cream sodas, good old fashioned ice cream sodas with the soda water syrup and ice cream and cream. And fraps, boy do we sell a lot of fraps. But in the fall too, in the fall and the winter because it's cold, uh, we make ice cream cakes for the holidays, especially Thanksgiving and Christmas. In addition to being a family business, this really has become a community business. Tell me about your staff. A lot of it is sibling passed down. We have brothers and sisters that are working here at the same time or pick up a new brother or sister when somebody goes off to college. Now I see you also celebrate them with all of the flags you have and all of the photos you have. Right, yeah, we sure do. These are banners that come from their colleges, whether it's been hanging up there for 35 years or, or more. The photos are really a family photo album. They decorate the walls. I can't tell you how many people come in to try to find themselves from working in 2000 or 1984 or something like that. So 35 years in business, coming here all of the time, meeting so many people, not just through Duxbury, but through the entire oh. South Shore and around the world. Yeah. What is it that means the most to you about this business? You know, it's a happy business. It's a successful business. That's really important um, and it you do you just meet the nicest people they're in a great mood when they get here who wouldn't be and working with these young people is really spectacular I have just I've, I've always felt very proud of the fact that that this has worked so well it's been a very good run these 35 years I'd say and I have no plans of changing it thanks for watching another show we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did Check out PAC TV's website for replay times and links, and you'll see us on YouTube. Be sure to follow us on social media for updates and behind the scenes fun. We will see you next week for more PAC TV community news.